likes for this videos. If we get more than 2000 likes at this videos we will upload more patriotic news. Birthday of the day Mark Preston, Executive Director of CNN Political Programming and Senior Political Analyst. How, where are you celebrating your birthday and with whom? Breaking news, I don't enjoy celebrating my birthday, for those who know me, this shouldn't be a surprise. But my children enjoy a good birthday party, ice cream and chocolate cake. So I will be celebrating this historic day with my family on a little island just off the East Coast. Far, far away from DC. How did you get your start in journalism? Does my fifth grade school newspaper count? My start has never really ended, each one of these news organizations, College Newspaper, UMass, Marietta Daily Journal, Georgia, States News Service, DC, Roll Call, DC, and CNN. DC slash a nation, have helped me learn how to grow as a journalist and, more importantly, as a person. What's an interesting book, article you're reading now or finished? And why? While I am no fan of books written by politicians, I offer this exception as a worthy read, Two Paths, America Divided or United by Ohio Governor John Kosich. Kosich spares no one the rod, and he offers a sobering view of our political system. Too many of our politicians and elected officials have taken to saying whatever they want to in order to make their point, and it doesn't seem to matter if what they're saying is even close to true. Dash chew on that Kosich observation for a moment, take two aspirins and do not call me in the morning. What is a trend going on in the US or abroad that doesn't get enough attention? Opiate addiction. The C to C estimates opiate overdoses claim 91 people every day. How is the Trump presidency going? It could be and should be going a lot better. What's a fun fact that people in Washington might not know about you? I once ate a Krispy Kreme donut in one bite. Try to top that John Bresnahan. What's your morning routine? A cup of coffee in my right hand and my smartphone in my left as I scroll through playbook to see how the day is shaping. Nerdcast Republicans Reset on Healthcare Again It's time for Episode 64 of the Nerdcast, Politico's podcast on the White House and politics. Tune in each week to geek out with us as we dive deep into the political landscape and the latest numbers that matter. Subscribe and rate the Nerdcast on iTunes. Listen on your smartphone here, listen on your desktop here. Data point, 54. That's how many times Republicans voted in the House and Senate to repeal, change or undo Obamacare by the spring of 2014. And yet, the latest version of the Senate health care bill failed to garner enough support to move forward to a vote this week. Data point, 15 percent. That's the corporate tax rate the President Trump is reportedly seeking in a broad, sweeping tax reform, one that, for all the difficulty Republicans have had shaping a health care bill. Observers are saying tax legislation will be ever trickier. Data point, 48. That's the number of interviews President Trump has conducted with the much maligned news media since he was inaugurated. The latest one, with the New York Times, revealed the president's thoughts on health care, his frustrations with Attorney General Jeff Sessions and even featured a cameo by his granddaughter Arabella Khan. White House enlisting conservative groups to pressure GOP senators on health care bill. The White House is quietly seeking to pressure senators to support the GOP health care bill with a network of grassroots and pro-life organizations. President Donald Trump's legislative affairs team has asked a number of conservative groups to score next week's vote, or in judge members and the re-election campaigns based on whether they support it. They have told the groups they want to keep pressuring members. Two people familiar with the conversations say, even if the vote fails next week. Leading the conversations has been Paul Teller, a former aide to Senator Ted Cruz, R. Tex, who has been serving as the main liaison to conservatives in the White House. Roughly 10 to 12 groups are expected to meet with White House aides Friday afternoon and later announce they will pressure GOP holdout senators, two people familiar with the planning said. West Wing officials and others outside said to expect a mix of social and fiscally conservative grassroots groups. 
among the groups expected is Susan B. Anthony List, an anti-abortion group that will be urging Republicans to support a procedural vote to begin debate and either the repeal and replace bill or just repeal only. SBA List sent a letter to Senators Thursday urging them to take action. The GOP Congress must move forward to send a bill defunding Planned Parenthood and mitigating the damage of Obamacare to President Trump's desk for his signature, said SBA List President Marjorie Dana Inflesser. The first step is voting for the motion to proceed to the House passed bill which replaces Obamacare abortion funding with health assistance that does not include abortion coverage. White House officials are privately skeptical the bill will pass next week, but say they will keep pushing to repeal the law even if the vote fails. The president wants something to happen, one of these people said. He's tired of nothing happening. He wants mo- Russia's foreign minister jokes there may have been more meetings between Trump and Putin. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov cracked a joke Friday that President Donald Trump and his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, may have had interactions beyond the three occasions on which they are known to have spoken at this month's G20 meeting, dismissing a question about it without outright denying the possibility. Well, maybe they went to a toilet together. That was a fourth time, Lavrov told NBC News in an interview that aired Friday morning. When you are brought by your parents to a kindergarten, do you mix with the people who are waiting in the same room to start going to a class, a classroom? Reminded by the NBC reporter that the G20 meeting is not a kindergarten classroom, Lavrov responded that he was only speaking in terms of logistics. Well, there is also room where they get together before an event starts. They cannot arrive all at the same time in a bus, the Russian foreign minister said. At last month's G20 meeting in Germany, Trump and Putin met for two hours, a sit-down in which Trump later said he pressed the Russian president multiple times about allegations of election interference. The two men also shook hands and spoke briefly before that meeting and also had a conversation that was disclosed just this week during a dinner with other G20 leaders. Trump and Putin's first meeting since the U.S. president's inauguration was highly anticipated and came amid ever-swirling controversy stemming from the Russian government's efforts to interfere in last year's U.S. election. Putin has denied any Russian involvement and while the U.S. intelligence community has been unequivocal in its assessment of the Kremlin's culpability, Trump himself has waffled at times on the issue most recently suggesting that Russia was likely just one of multiple nations and entities that sought to affect last November's election. That the U.S. president has thus far been unwilling to take a tougher stance against Russia has raised eyebrows among politicians from both parties in Washington as well as among world leaders around the globe. Lavrov characterized Trump's administration as being under siege from opponents eager to drag it down. The fight goes on. They want to make the life of this administration miserable. People try to speak about impeachment, Lavrov said. It's absolutely a fight. And Russia is on President Trump's side? The NBC reporter asked. No, we are on the side of justice, Lavrov rep- Dennis McDonough defends Obama's Russia hacking response in op-ed. A senior official from the administration of Barack Obama defended the former president's handling of Russian efforts to interfere in last year's presidential election, which current President Donald Trump has at times characterized as negligent or worse. Seeking to set the record straight about the events of last fall, Dennis McDonough, Obama's chief of staff from 2013 until he left office earlier this year, wrote in a Washington Post op-ed published Thursday night that the former president worked with his own intelligence community as well as leaders in Congress to protect not just the integrity of last November's election but also the public's confidence in it. Obama also directed the intelligence community to seek out and make public as much evidence of Russia's culpability as possible, McDonough said. On two occasions, the former chief of staff said, Russia was warned directly about the consequences of continued efforts to interfere in the U.S. election, once in early October directly from Obama to Putin and again later that month via the Russian embassy in Washington. 
We believe that these direct warnings in fact cause the Russians to dial back their efforts to interfere, McDonough said. And while the government first made public its assessment that Russia was behind the campaign of election year cyber attacks, internal government movements on it began much earlier, according to McDonough. Briefings for congressional leaders began in August and continued throughout the month. The president also invited the majority and minority leaders from both houses of Congress to the White House to ask them to release a bipartisan statement of concern on the election interference efforts, McDonough said. Such a statement was intended to help insulate the White House's efforts from appearing partisan, McDonough said. With the same goal in mind, he recalled the White House asking two Democrats not to release a public statement on the Russian cyber attacks. Despite McDonough's assertions published Thursday, as well as past statements from other Obama administration officials, Trump and his defenders have insisted that his predecessor did not do enough in the moment to stop the Kremlin's efforts to affect the election. At least one Obama official, quoted anonymously in a Post story published last month, agreed, telling a reported that I feel like we sort of choked in responding to Moscow's activities. Trump himself has said that Obama was unwilling to more forcefully address Russia's efforts because he was fearful of rocking the boat in what, for almost all of last fall, appeared was going to be an easy victory for Democrat Hillary Clinton. It was only after Trump's surprise victory that the issue became a ready excuse for embarrassed Democrats, the president has argued. In his op-ed, McDonough called on Trump to take a firmer stance against Russia and follow through on the work began by Obama to more forcefully respond to the Kremlin. Those steps, the former chief of staff said, should ensure that renewed efforts by Russia will not succeed. Russia poses a threat to our democracy. Yet the past several months have also seen too much denial, finger-pointing and partisan posturing on this issue, he wrote.